Thank you very much for that welcome, and it's very good to be here, and I admire your staying power. <laughs> How many people here have or are working or studying in a university in a STEM subject, science, technology, engineering, maths? Quite a fraction. Good. This is what I'm largely talking about, people like you, and I hope you find it interesting. So. It's about equality in UK university science, but also engineering, technology, maths. So what's been happening over the last few years is we've been collecting data. How many women and men are there at each level in a university? And it perhaps doesn't surprise you to learn that women are in a minority, and the higher the level, this is in STEM subjects, remember, the higher the level, the minority gets smaller. It also shows that women progress more slowly than their male counterparts. And it shows that women academics put in fewer grant applications for less money. They're less willing to apply for jobs. If their grant application gets rejected, they wait longer before putting it in again, and so on. So, some bright soul said, um, yep, clearly there's a problem with the women. We need to fix it. <laughs> fix the women. Make them braver. Make them put in more applications, better applications, write better CVs. And there was no suggestion that there was anything wrong with the society, academic society, in which the women were embedded. Um, the, the way universities had operated and continued to operate was clearly perfectly okay. It was the women who were deficient. One of the other things invented was special fellowships for women, so only women could apply. And the first few women who got those fellowships reported quite frequently that some charming colleagues would say to them, you only got that fellowship because you're a woman. You're pulling down the standard of the department. You should leave. So we learnt a bit about that. These days, fellowships will be advertised for men and women. And if women get them, they can say, I got it in competition with men, and I was better than a number of the men. That's why I'm here. About probably 15, 20 years ago, a group of senior women scientists got together to think what maybe could be done to improve the lot of women in science, technology, engineering. You'll recognize some of them perhaps. Top left, Julia Higgins. Middle left, Wendy Hall. Top right, Jill Samuels, who actually worked for Pfizer. Um, bottom left, Caroline Fox. You'll recognize the woman in the middle and Nancy Lane on the bottom right, who is also a biologist. And we met out of ours in a borrowed room in our own time to discuss how to attract more women into science and how to keep them in science. But we were broke. We had no money. Well, we had a little bit of money. And a breakthrough was when Caroline, bottom left, said, you know, Vice chancellors are competitive guys. They were all men at that point. She said, if we run a competition, if we offer a prize, they'll compete. We'll offer a prize for the most woman-friendly university. <laughs> well, because we were broke, as a prize, we could only offer a glass rose bowl. But she was right. We announced this competition. And vice chancellors competed to be the most woman-friendly university. Started small, but it grew. It caught on. And arising out of that was developed the whole of the Athena Swan scheme, which some of you will probably know far too much about, may have bitter experiences of it. So Athena Swan Awards encourage recognize a commitment to advancing the careers of women in higher education. 
they've now been extended to gender equality more generally because in the arts, social sciences, humanities, it's men who are in the minority, not women, quite often, at least in terms of numbers, if not in terms of power. And we uh, gradually got established these Athena Swan Awards. You hold the award for three years as a department or a university, and then you have to reapply. And one of the subtleties about it that people don't always realize is it's your, your gradient, how rapidly you're improving, is as important as to where you actually are at the moment. But it grew a bit slowly until something happened. The Chief Medical Officer for England and Wales, Dame Sally Davis, was, she holds research funds. She was meeting with the heads of medical departments in universities, and they were talking about the kind of things you can imagine funders talk about with people who want their funds. And at the end of the meeting, she said, um, you're all male, where are the women? And they said, oh, doesn't matter. And she had, as she put it, a rush of blood to the head. And she said, if you want my funding, within three years, you've got to have more women in your department. And that was the beginning of Athena Swan being taken seriously. She insisted that they had to have Athena Swan bronze, lowest level. And attaching money to this kind of thing, I regret to say, makes a huge difference. People take it seriously. I wish I could say otherwise, but it has, I have to admit that money speaks in a way that very few other things do speak. So we now have Athena Swan programmes right, left and centre. How women friendly is your university or your university department? And not only the medics, but other areas of research, the funders there are also insisting that universities hold or university departments hold an Athena Swan Award before they can apply. So change is happening. And interestingly, it's got expanded. It's moved now beyond science, engineering, technology, maths, to arts, humanities, social sciences, areas where often it's the men that are in a minority. And so it's all about equality and equality of experience in universities. Um, very much to my surprise, it has also expanded internationally. It's now in Ireland, and it's pretty fierce in Ireland because by the end of 2019, if a university centrally does not hold Athena Swan Bronze, no department in that university can apply for research funds. There will be some casualties, I think. It's really, really tough. Um, it's gone beyond Ireland to Australia, where it's called SAGE. It's gone beyond Australia to Canada, where it's just coming in. And in the United States, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, is trying to get not only Athena Swan, but something similar for all the other areas um, rolled out. We'll see how that goes. USA is a different kind of country. So, consequences. It's a lot of work doing an Athena Swan submission. You have to get data on how many women students you have, how many women junior faculty, senior faculty, professors, support staff. Uh, you have to get information on what their pay levels are. You have to get information on how rapidly they're being promoted or not. All this kind of stuff. And it's still too often the case that one of the few women in the department is asked to do all that data collation and write the application. Um, I think they're going to start asking about the gender balance of the people who prepared the submission. But 
Um, it's proving to be a good model. Uh, I think it's going to help with some of the other areas. Um, for instance, it might well help with the black um, BMA, black minority ethnic groups. How many people of colour do you have in your department? How are they progressing? Um, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus issues could probably also be done the same way although Stonewall is already doing quite a bit of that. Uh, there is an area, though, where there's some confusion that I really want to stress, and this is to do with institutional change. You can have an individual who is not sexist, emphatically not sexist or prejudiced in any other way, but working in an establishment which structures are sexist. And there is a difference between the individual and the institution. Uh, hopefully with time individuals could change an institution, but it doesn't happen overnight. So you can have institutional sexism, for example. Uh, you can have people who suffer because they've got slightly different management styles. It's not macho enough. You're not a good manager, therefore. Um, and there's also unconscious bias. How many people here have heard of unconscious bias? Wow, that's really good. Okay. The most spectacular example I know of unconscious bias, right, is in orchestras, but I won't go there. Um, I'm going to point to one other thing. Oops. See this down the bottom? You have to fill in a form where you take a one of two boxes. Any comments on those boxes? There's only two. Yeah, there should be more these days. Yep. The male is first. It's not alphabetical order, is it? That's unconscious bias. So I'm going to skip that. Um, it's a little sad that incentives are needed to make this happen, but it does seem to be the case. Um, the system's not perfect, I will accept, but it's a great improvement over having nothing, and I'm proud to be one of the originators of Athena Swan. Thank you very much. <laughs>